Hey there, chemistry team. Are you ready for a new day and a new journey? Video number six in our thermodynamics. Woo, it's gonna be fun. This is one of the more challenging ones. This is gonna be a mind bender for you. So good, get your favorite beverage, relax, take some chem zen material, whatever you gotta do. <laughs> but I love deriving things and this is gonna be the, the ultimate derivation. Remember, our goal in thermodynamics is to take all of these thermodynamic you know, parameters that have an impact on whether a reaction is going to occur or not. Is it spontaneous under the conditions written? Does it need any outside help? Can we collapse that down into just one simple little thing? We like to simplify things, right? Well, let's do that. Let's take a, what we're going to do as we're going to derive Gibbs energy. Now, a lot of people, it was, back, back in my day, it was called Gibbs free energy, uh, you know, the work available for a reaction, all that kind of stuff. Um, but pretty much, people are trying to just condense that down into Gibbs energy, G. That's the thermodynamic variable that we want to relate to that ultimate question, hey, is that process or that reaction spontaneous as written at that temperature and that pressure? And if that number is less than zero or greater than zero, it can tell us whether it's spontaneous or not. Hey, it makes life simple. Deriving it, not so simple. <laughs> All right, put your thinking hats on. Here we go. Let's start with the second law of thermodynamics. That's a key one because that was a direct requirement for spontaneity. Remember in the second law of thermodynamics, if you need to go back and review that, the first, second, and third laws, for a spontaneous process, this is the requirement the entropy of the universe must increase. Boom! Easy peasy, right? Good luck calculating that, <laughs> right? How are you going to calculate the change in entropy of the universe? Not going to happen, right? Not a little, little peabody human brains here. Right? We, can't, we can't do that. So let's break this down into pieces and try to get this into something that we can actually do. So let's write what delta S universe is. Remember, the universe is the system that we're focused on and all the surroundings. That is the sum total of the universe. So we know that delta S universe is equal to the change in entropy of the system plus the change in entropy of the surrounding. Now, I'm gonna get real tired writing surroundings out, so I'll just go, you know, you know, UNIV for universe and SYS for system and SURR for surroundings. That takes a while to drop. We like to condense things down. So what I want to do is get that delta S universe into some other terms that we could actually maybe measure or calculate uh, in, a, in a relatively simplistic fashion. Well, nothing in thermodynamics is simplistic, is it? All right. Now the system, we could, we could get that, right? Delta S system. We showed you a couple ways that you could calculate that already. So this is, we can, we can do this. I spelled can wrong. You know, that's a good day to start. <laughs> right? Delta S system. We could, we could, we could beat our heads, you know, beat our heads against the wall and figure that out. Delta S surroundings. That's not going to happen. <laughs> All right. Not, not, not doable. Not what word do you want to put there? It's not going to happen. <laughs> not going to happen. I'll put solvable. So that, the change in entropy of the surroundings, which is the rest of the universe, not, it's just not going to happen. It's not going to be solvable for us. So what we want to do is we want to get delta S of the surroundings in terms of the system. If we can get everything in terms of the system, we can actually calculate this and see and, and get this delta S universe in some other form of the system. All right. So I'll make one last, last little comment. Get in terms of the system. All right. So get in terms of the system. That's our goal. So let's review back and look at some of the things we've looked at um, for delta S, right? We looked at um, delta S using the uh, appendix, right? I think it's appendix D for us, that table um, for standard conditions. 
we looked at delta S was Q reversible over T, which was a little more challenging because that reversibility constraint was difficult. But if we're dealing with the, the rest of the universe, huge surroundings, we could probably make an assumption that if we deal with heat flow from the system to the surroundings and we take the whole entire universe and these infinitesimally small steps uh, that are reversible, um, we might be able to make that estimation um, where we could use that equation delta S is Q reversible over T. So let me erase this board. Let's see if we can do this. Get your, well, you don't have one of these. Get your pencils ready, <laughs> right? Or unless you're writing on your computer. Let's make that adjustment, right? So we remember delta S is Q reversible over T. So let's plug that in for the surroundings. We're okay with the system, but let's plug it in for the surroundings. So we can rewrite this now, that the change in the energy of the universe, energy, entropy, is the change in entropy of the system plus the reversible heat flow of, let's just put surroundings here, over T. All right, so I'm just gonna take that uh, and put Q surroundings over T instead of delta S, all right? Now again, that has to be reversible and we're gonna make that assumption that when we're dealing with the entire universe, um, that we can, we can use Q surroundings as delta H, all right? So we're gonna assume that the Q of the surroundings is equal to the enthalpy change of the surroundings, right? We did that for phase changes, I think it was. That was about as close in the laboratory that we could get to a re reversible process. But in this theoretical you know, brain mess we're doing right now, <laughs> right, we could make that assumption, dealing with the whole universe. So let's plug that in. See how we're doing all these substitutions? All right, so that means that the change in the entropy of the universe will be equal to the change in entropy of the system plus the entropy change of the surroundings over the temperature. All right. Problem is, we're still in terms of the surroundings. We want to get in terms of the system. But there's another law. Remember the first law of thermodynamics uh, at constant pressure? Because remember, at constant pressure, Q is equal to delta H. We're good, we're good with that when we can make that assumption. First law of thermodynamics says that any heat lost by the system must be gained by the surroundings, correct? Or vice versa, lost by the surroundings must go to the system. So the numerical values are the same. So isn't delta H surroundings the same value as delta H system, but opposite in sign? Oh, right? Delta H surroundings will be equal to negative delta H of the system. Can you see how we're gonna get rid of surroundings terms and get it into system terms? terms? This is the first law. So we're taking two of these three main thermodynamic laws and, and doing some uh, algebraic gymnastics here, <laughs> right? So let's plug that in there. So delta S universe will be delta S system uh, minus delta H system over temperature. Now we got everything in terms of the system, nice. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna move some variables around so we can get to this new thermodynamic parameter called Gibbs energy. I'm gonna multiply through by the negative sign and by the temperature, right? I wanna get, I wanna get the temperature away from the system and over here. So let's multiply through by the negative sign and the temperature. So this becomes negative and I have a T there. So negative T delta S universe, right? Multiply through by negative and T, that would be negative T delta S system. Let me write that down. I see the big S and I don't write the small s there. So multiply by negative, multiply by T, and then we get rid of the T, get rid of the negative. This would be plus delta H 
system. All right, that's all I did. I skipped a few steps there. I just multiplied through by the negative sign, multiplied through by the temperature. So these get the temperature term, that temperature goes away. So I don't have a denominator floating around, which is kind of nice. Now, I don't like starting with a negative. Let's flip these two terms. All right, let's just, let's just flip them. Not a big deal. So negative T delta S universe, we can now write that as the change in enthalpy of the system minus the temperature change, temperature times the entropy change of the system. See what we did using the first and second law of thermodynamics? Ah, try to do that on your own, right? While you're eating breakfast or lunch, you know, grab a napkin, do a back of the napkin calculation. See if you can do that. Start with the second law of thermodynamics and then end up with this, all right? So we got delta S universe just with the negative temperature over here is equal to this term in terms of, remember, when we started this whole chapter, we said we want to get spontaneity uh, in one variable, but what, what encompasses that? We said enthalpy change, entropy change, and temperature. Enthalpy change, entropy change, and temperature. Oh, so what we're going to do is we're going to take these right here, and we're going to let the, if, we, if you get rid of the deltas for now, the enthalpy minus the temperature times the entropy, we're going to call that G. That's your Gibbs energy. Let's let that equal H minus TS. All right, and that's your Gibbs energy. Now that's a new term that we're introducing. And that gives energy, encompasses the enthalpy, the temperature, and the entropy. But what I want to do is get that terms in the changes. This is the non-changes. We can't really, because we can't determine absolute enthalpy values, we can entropy because the third law of thermodynamics. But since we can't determine absolute enthalpy values of a system at some state, we can't calculate Gibbs energy for a specific state. But we could calculate the change between state one and state two. Right? This is a a path independent function. Um, so what I'm going to do is just put a delta in front of the G, a delta in front of the H, and a delta in front of the S, and we get this term, and that'll be the change in Gibbs energy. But I need a new board, so I'm going to pause this, erase it, rewrite this back up, and then put the Gibbs free energy change on the board for you. All right, we got this. So all I did is just rewrote that final value that we had here. We are going to let this whole term be delta G. Now, I'm not going to write a subscript anymore. Um, if there's no subscript, that's assumed to be system because we're getting rid of surroundings and universe stuff. We, everything will be in terms of the system anyway. So we're just going to call the change in the Gibbs free energy, and that would be of the system, right, is equal to the delta H minus T delta S. That is one of the main, main meat and potato equations for thermodynamics because all the parameters of spontaneity are encompassed in this one term, and that is the change in Gibbs free energy. So change in the Gibbs energy. So I'm going to put up one more relation because obviously by this definition, then the delta G is equal to negative T delta S universe. So negative T delta S universe equals delta G. Now we're not going to be using this. I keep spelling universe wrong. Universe. It's, it's universe without an E. We're not going to be using this one because we can't calculate delta S universe, right? But we could calculate the enthalpy change of the system. We do know the temperature. We can calculate the entropy change of the system, which means we can calculate the Gibbs free energy change of the system, which is now related to the entropy change in the universe with the temperature factor there and a negative sign. So remember, what's the requirement from the second law of thermodynamics for spontaneity? Delta S must be positive. All right. So for a spontaneous process, delta S universe is positive for a spontaneous process. 
running out of board space. All right. So this term right here must be positive. See that? So the delta S universe must be positive. So to be spontaneous, what must delta G be? What must the Gibbs energy change be, positive or negative, for a spontaneous process? So take a look at it. If that's positive, correct? Temperature is a Kelvin temperature. Can that be negative? No, it can. It's the absolute temperature scale, the lowest. Day. How low can you go? Zero. So the temperature in Kelvin cannot be negative. So the temperature is positive, which means, you see that negative sign there? Delta G has to be negative to make this true for a spontaneous process. Because okay. if that's positive for a spontaneous process, and that's positive because it has to be in the Kelvin temperature, delta G must be negative for a spontaneous process. That is what we're after. That is another way of looking at the second law of thermodynamics. So delta G must be negative for a spontaneous process. Holy moly. So I'll put up another board on here, and we'll take a look at, you know, what does it mean if delta G is greater than zero, less than zero, or equal to zero. That really summarizes all this stuff we've been talking about. All right? Uh, so all of this is for non-standard conditions, and most of our calculations are going to be, uh, for the next couple of videos, at standard conditions, and then we'll take a look at what if we're not at standard conditions, which we hardly ever are in the lab. So let me erase this board, and I'm going to put this back up again. And let's take a look at these delta G values. All right, let's kind of try to relate this to equilibrium a little bit. Remember, when we've got a, a reaction or a process at equilibrium, the forward rates equals to the reverse rate. There's no tendency to go one way or the other. Um, but if you're not at equilibrium, there's a drive to go towards equilibrium. So a lot of times delta G is going to allow us to look at which way it's going to drive. We did uh, Q versus K before to figure that out, reaction quotient. But let's take a look here. There's really only three scenarios. Either the change in Gibbs energy is going to be less than zero or negative, greater than zero or positive, or equal to zero. I'm having a hard time thinking if there's other possibilities. <laughs> Onto that for a little bit. It may be early in the morning. But I have my favorite beverage here. Oh, I wonder what it is. If you're my students, you know what it is. I'm a doer. All right, here we go. And we already mentioned this one. If it's negative because of this, right? If this is negative, then that's positive and that's positive. That means it's spontaneous. So at whatever is provided for pressure, temperature, composition, whatever it, the, the state is, as written, that would be spontaneous, right? And that will proceed in the direction as written until it reaches equilibrium. All right. That means it's not at equilibrium, and it's going to drive to the right towards products as written until it achieves equilibrium. Now, obviously, this is the opposite. If delta G is positive, and T is always positive, and this is negative, that means delta S universe would have to be negative for that to happen, right, mathematically. That's not happy. That, the universe ain't happy at all. So that would mean that's non-spontaneous or not spontaneous, however you want to do that. So if your delta G value, your change in Gibbs energy, once I show you different ways to calculate that, whether it's standard conditions or non-standard conditions, whatever temperature you're at, whatever pressure, however it's written, not spontaneous as written, right? So you can almost think of it as it would go the other direction, right? Because if Gibbs, if the Gibbs energy change is negative in going right to left, it'd be positive going left to right. It's the same numerical value, just flipped by the negative sign, right? Remember, if you reverse an equation in thermodynamics, you just change the sign on the thermodynamic value, whether it's delta S, delta H, doesn't matter, delta G. So non-spontaneous is written if you got a positive delta G. All right, well, if delta G is zero, it's not spontaneous or not spontaneous. I mean, there's no drive to go either direction, which means you're at equilibrium. Right? There's no driving force, no tendency to go one way or the other. We are at equilibrium. 
Sweet, huh? So what I want to do is take a look at the other equation where delta G was, what was it, delta H minus T delta S. Let's write that up on the board and just qualitatively, we're not going to put numbers into it, just qualitatively sit back and look at it and go, there's obviously three parameters involved. The enthalpy change, delta H of the system, the entropy change, delta S of the system, and the temperature, which was how we started this whole thing. I, I, in my first video, I mentioned these are our three parameters that impact spontaneity. Let's take a look at you know whether one's favorable, one's not favorable, and look at the combinations of those. We're going to get four different scenarios, and we'll end the video after that. All right, see if you can predict this. I kind of laid this out for you. So here's like the meat and potato equation. There's a couple big ones for thermal. This is one of the big ones. So that's our definition of Gibbs uh, energy, enthalpy minus the absolute uh, Kelvin temperature times the uh, entropy change, all in terms of the system. Remember, no subscript. It's going to be system. There's only four possibilities, right? So the delta H is either going to be negative or positive. Delta S will be negative or positive. So that gives us four scenarios. So in case one, the enthalpy change is negative, entropy change is positive. In case two, entropy change is negative. Entropy change is also negative. Case three, entropy change is positive. Entropy change is also positive. And in case four, the entropy, the enthalpy change is positive and the entropy change is negative. Let's think about whether each one of these is favorable or not favorable for spontaneity and look at how they affect delta G. And remember, delta G negative is spontaneous. Delta G positive is non-spontaneous. So let's look at this. So if the enthalpy change is negative, right, exothermic, that's a favorable process. Right? So I would say this is favorable. That's a happy situation, right? Um, delta S positive, now remember that the driving force for spontaneity is the entropy of the universe is increasing. So entropy increases is, is a very positive, oh, no pun intended, it's a positive thing. That's more favorable. So this is favorable. So in this scenario, the enthalpy change and the entropy change are working in concert. They're working together to create an ultimate perfect scenario for spontaneity. Because if, remember, delta G has to be negative. So if delta H is negative and delta S is positive, remember, if delta S is positive and T is positive, this term is always negative. That term is always negative. So delta G is always negative. So this is spontaneous. at all temperatures. You guys agree with me? That's spontaneous at all temperatures. It doesn't matter what temperature it is, because if delta S is positive, this whole term is always negative. That's always negative. So they work together. It's always spontaneous. See if you can do the rest of this for me. Pause the video. Tell me whether each one's favorable or not favorable. And then what temperatures would make the overall delta G negative, which would be spontaneous. Pause it. All right, here we go. Obviously, this is favorable, right? Exothermic reactions are favorable as far as spontaneity. But in this case, delta S is negative. Entropy is dropping, not happy. It wants to increase, right? So this is not favorable. So how does that affect the overall delta G? Remember, this needs to be negative. Right? So this term's always negative. Right? But if delta S is negative, this is always positive. Temperature is always positive, and that's negative. That means the T delta S term with the negative sign is always going to be positive. So they're working against each other. This is favorable enthalpically. Is that a word? No, it is now. Uh, but not favorable entropically. They're working against each other. So let's look at how, so it really, the spontaneity of this particular scenario is temperature dependent because they're working against each other. And the entropy is impacted by the temperature. So the bigger, the, the higher the temperature, the more impact this term has. And since delta S is negative, that means this is always positive. As the temperature goes higher and higher and higher, this term becomes more and more positive. And there's a point, even if delta H is negative, if the temperature is high enough, the more positive nature of that overwhelms the negative nature of the delta H and you get a positive delta G. So this is not happy at high temperatures, right? It, it emphasizes the higher the temperature, the more the entropy changes emphasize. 
So this is spontaneous at lower temperatures. So what temperature? Ah, we, I'll show you how to calculate that, right? Mm -hmm. But not in this one. So this is spontaneous at lower temperatures. So that is spontaneous at lower temperatures. All right. Makes sense? Because that minimizes that term and maximizes this term. So let's do this next one. Delta H is positive. Now it's endothermic. That's not favorable. But the entropy is positive. Increasing entropy is favorable. They're again working against each other. But now it's flip-flop. This term is always positive. Delta S is positive. So now delta S is positive and T is positive. This term, T delta S, will always have a negative value. The delta H is positive. So this is better at higher temperatures. The higher temperature emphasizes the entropy change more. So if we increase the temperature, the negative portion, T delta S, can overwhelm the fact that it's endothermic and make it spontaneous. So this would be spontaneous at higher temperatures. Okay. Let's write that down. Spontaneous. Do the last one. At higher temperature values. See? Not so bad. And in the next video, we'll show you how to calculate these kinds of things. Actually, look up values of delta H and delta S and calculate this. All right. In our last scenario, the enthalpy change is positive. It's endothermic. That's not favorable. And you'll get some questions in your homework and stuff where it'll give you, uh, let's say, a chemical reaction. And from the reaction, you should be able to estimate whether the entropy change is positive or negative. Are you forming more gas, less gas, those kinds of things. Um, it'll either give you a delta H or like if you're breaking bonds, obviously delta H will be endothermic. So you can estimate delta H being positive or negative. You can estimate delta S being positive or negative. You don't need specific values. And you can see which situation this would be. Always spontaneous at all temperatures, spontaneous only at lower temperatures, spontaneous only at higher temperatures. And this one, delta H, it, it's not favorable enthalpically. And the entropy is dropping, so that's also not favorable. So both of these are going not good, man. No matter what, if this is positive, and this is, if delta S is negative, the T delta S term is always going to be positive with the negative sign. So no matter what temperature you're at, Delta G will be positive. It doesn't matter. So this is non-spontaneous at any temperature. This is a horrible scenario for spontaneity. So this is never spontaneous. Not a good business model to run on, right? <laughs> you want to run a business on a chemical reaction that's never spontaneous? You got to constantly put energy in and make that work, man. That's not necessarily smart. I'd rather do something like this case. So good qualitative stuff. Write that down. Let's do some math in the next video. Yay, math.